Father, thank you for today, for a beautiful day. Thank you, Lord, for this impulsion. We pray that you will bless each speaker, that you will bless the students as they hear, and that we will learn from each other. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, welcome to our symposium on the work of research in preparing self-regulated teacher candidates. My name is Johanna Wilma. I'm the Administrative Assistant for the School of Education. Um, I was also an alumna of the program. Um, I was privileged to be here while a lot of this research was going on, so that's very special. Um, our discussion will be Andres Valenzuela. Um, he's the Director of Admissions here. Um, our symposium will present the work based on research in the peer-reviewed book, Developing Self-Regulation of Learning and Teaching Skills Among Teacher Candidates. Um, the authors are Dr. Heffer Dundanuti, Dr. Marie White, and Professor Miriam Phillips. Um, presenting to you today are two of the authors, Dr. Marie White, who will be presenting on research-based development of teacher candidates, Professor Miriam Velez, who will be presenting on the on-site research of teacher candidates during school observations and classroom experiences. And we also um, have two of our research participants and alumni with us here today, Jose Martinez and Arlene Rodriguez. development of teacher candidates and we're calling this about the work of research in our setting right here at Guyana College in the city. So I was praying about how to present this to you and this book has been part of my life and Professor, Professor Velez's life for over almost 10 years in the making. And so I thought this is really my story and that's probably what compelled me to do the work that we do here. And so I was accepted at Gordon College after I was rejected by every college in the city, except for Kingsborough. And they accepted me, but the first semester I was on probation, and I was also in remedial classes. So I was one of those people that just said, oh, I'm here, I'll have a good time, maybe get a out on the weekends, not much for academics because I was failing everything. However, I was underprepared. I was regions prepared, but I was not college prepared. I was not academically prepared. And I went to a fairly good high school in New York City. And I was good at taking a test, but I didn't have such a great GPA score. My SAT scores weren't so great. But somebody I knew, who knew my father, knew someone at Gordon, and there I went. <laughs> but that's where I stepped over that help-seeking ledge. When I was drowning, I just began to look around and say, hey, if I don't get help, I am never going to make it out of here. And I was in the secondary ed program to be a history teacher. So as I've been looking at my own case, I realized that every story needs data to support it, because I didn't collect data on myself, but we did collect data on our students here in our program. And one of the reasons we stre stress that research matters is that this case study of four teacher candidates was based on our ongoing interest in the success of our program here in the city. Therefore, we chose self-regulated learning as a focus for our study, and we linked it to the core values of Nyack College. However, we have an enrollment that reflects the population of many inner city campuses. Therefore, we decided that we would develop a program that was effective for urban schools, and also the person would be equipped to teach in suburban schools, but urban first. Therefore, also, the college, our college is nationally recognized for our diversity, our SES, so everything kind of started coming together about, I think it's almost 10 years ago now. So why did we choose self-regulation? Well, back when we started, she's been here longer than me, but I'm older than her. Um, NIAC was basically an open enrollment program. So we were beginning to work with students. This is before those two started. This was when we first started here. But there was evidence in the research that self-regulation learning processes are related to academic success. And most students that would be coming to us were not receiving any training in self-regulation. So although academically they were, might have been 
struggling in high school, it wasn't necessarily because they could not do the work, it was no one ever showed them how to study, how to time manage. And therefore, we also decided that we wanted to teach our students to plan, organize, monitor, evaluate, and think about the learning process. And this is what we did. The pathway to the book, I'm not going to read all that to you, don't have it, but I just want you to know that many articles were published in peer-reviewed journals as we were collecting data over a series of years. And then I met Dr. Benvenuti because I was working on my pilot study as part of this whole process, and he's the first author of the book, and we could not have done this without him. He's a uh, chair over at Queens College, he's a visiting scholar at Michigan University, and he was the one that turned to us and said, you really have a book here. So this takes us way back when I had dark hair to the basement of Worth Street. And when I found this picture, I thought, we began with a problem because we were now going to be evaluated based on could our students pass the state certification exams. And so we needed to find a solution. The solution is collect data, see where we are, see what we need to do. And I wanted to say, this is a lot of work. Because this started with an Excel sheet and it became this in an article that we published. So now the implications of our study. We're, we have a problem where the teacher of the classroom is no longer looking like the student in the classroom. We do not have a diverse population of teachers, especially in our inner cities, and we desperately need the, the students need role models. The best place to find that person is within the neighborhood, and that's what Jose and Arlene can attest to, because both of them are teaching in areas where the students are challenged and bilingual. So how, in order to tap this, this pool of candidates, we needed to find a way to get them to pass the teacher certification exams. That was the biggest thing. Once they arrived here at NIAC with the support system here and with the tutoring systems and all of the help that you can get, it wasn't a matter of struggling to pass their classes, it was a matter of struggling to pass those state exams. So we decided that we would have a learning environment that was rich in nurturing and encouragement, which is part of the core values, that would include training and self-regulated learning with academic vigor, so you have to be very motivated to want to learn in order to participate, and that we could attract and retain more minority and underprepared students than a college that would only provide academic and financial support. There was a piece missing, and that piece, I want to move ahead. Oh, sorry, I left out the slide. I deleted the slide. But that piece is what we call our Christian value system that we were entering into this with a motivation that was beyond an academic solution to that we were motivated then to, to speak into lives, to be part of people's lives, and then at, at that point, they could independently take over and learn into, on their own. So, this is, this is what we put in the book, and I'm just gonna read it to you because we really are challenging all programs that are addressing teacher education. And what we are saying is, based on our model, even Ed Kate said, find a way to make sure that we have a diverse teaching population by helping teacher candidates who have done poorly in high school to pass the state exams. That was back in 2003, and that was research that I did for my dissertation. When I found that, I said to Professor Willett, hey, Ed Kate is telling us to do that. This is our accrediting agency that is now Kate. I met um, Sabuka out at AERA, and I said to him, with all these new standards where they're saying, oh, we will never um, get accredited because we're not going to be able to show that we're passing the exam, he said to me, diversity trumps the test scores. So basically, if we are showing, and we have, that we are putting teachers in the classrooms in the most challenged areas of New York City, that would trump whether or not we were making that 85% test score limit. And also, our accreditation is not dependent upon how we admit students, but it's dependent on how we prepare them, which we feel is something that NIAC is very special. So last, we said, those in charge of admissions to these programs should carefully evaluate each applicant's prior educational experience, and if appropriate, attribute prior failures to poorly constructed learning environments rather than a disinterest in school or a lack of motivation. Accounting for the impact of the interactive influences, if you know my work, it's all social cognitive theory, 
the environment interacts with the self and behavior. Therefore, look at the environment, the individual, and the context. Teacher training programs can begin to address the deficits. So, this is how our work ended. We're happy here. That's Dr. Benvenuti, and that's Miriam and I the day that we were celebrating like we are done with this. And then I wanted just to show you, Debbie was not here, but Johanna, from day one, Debbie was our student worker. She contributed to helping us keep our data, put it into SPSS, Johanna followed. We have an outcome that is unbelievable. If, we, if I did the stats for you, you would be actually surprised at how many students have graduated here that had such abysmal high school experiences and are now full-time teachers. And we are saying that we have taken our students on the journey from our classroom to their classroom. Mine is brief. I'm going to explain to you how we conducted the research. Dr. White explained the theory and many of the things we did, but how did we actually get data so we can produce a book and show that it works? What we did was on-site research. What does that mean? Well, the teacher candidates at the time were four. There's two of them here representing the four. And they were doing their student teaching. But they were in schools. What schools? Well, we had three um, of the candidates in public schools, and we had one in a private school. Each setting was chosen specifically for the student, if that was where they live in Queens, or uh, there were different reasons why we chose the schools for the student teaching piece. And we will then go into the school, Dr. I and myself, and observe the students. Now, they weren't guinea pigs. They knew they were being observed. They agreed to the research. It wasn't like, oh, if I go into that program, they're going to be watching me. No, 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 that's against the law. We cannot do that. They willingly participated in the research and allowed us to come into the school. We had to have permission from the principals and the assistant principals to come in and um, gather the data and do the research. That's the researchers. That's the three of us, Dr. Benvenuti, who's in Queens. And between all of us, we probably have over 60 years of clinical, if you add everybody's 20, 25, 30 years of experience. And what does that mean? That we have been in the field ourselves, that we have been teaching, we have been in public school, private school, so we do know the field. The observation. <clears throat> the teachers' candidates were each observed three times, okay? So we went to the school three times and we sat and we observed. What were we looking for? We wanted to see if they were using self-regulatory practices in their teaching. We wanted to see were they doing help-seeking as they were teaching. Will they use self-efficacy? How was classroom management for these students that in, in a matter of, at the end of the semester, were gonna be certified? Okay? and then be teachers themselves. So we were looking for these pieces, and we were looking to see, are they paying attention to the diverse learners? That means the students that are English language learners, the students that have special needs, all of that. I say, well, how did you pay attention to all of that? How can you pay attention to all these little pieces? Well, we did it with all of these instruments. Every single instrument that's here, mentioned on this slide, we used. Um, as a scale to to um, to observe the students. So these reliable instruments were constructed. Some of them came like a higher teacher sense of efficacy scale. Some were designed by Dr. Vandermutti himself, some by Dr. White. Others we use from other sources, but every single one of them we use as we went to observe them. So what happens in an observation when a person, a researcher comes in? Well, couple of things. The observation was broken into three phases. It was first, it was first phase before the lesson. In this 
to place maybe 10 minutes before we walk into the classroom when we met with the student and they talked to us. But at times, that first phase took place the day before. There were many times I would get a phone call. Professor, 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 tomorrow I'm going to be observing. Now, we are serving as researchers, but these students had supervisors, clinical supervisors that were also observing them. We were going as researchers, the clinical supervisors were going for, they're going to get a grade. They either pass or fail and become teachers. So they will call and they will have these frantic, um, come in, come in. these frantic conversations like, I'm doing a science lesson and, and I don't really know where I'm going with this. Now, it will be easy for me to say, well, do this, do that, do that. But those of you that are administrators here sitting here, like my friend Janice, know that that will not work. So it's okay, well, what do you have? So the student will tell me. And as they were talking, they sort of walked through self-regulation and say, no, I don't think I'm going to do that. I just want to take the room. And, and I'm hearing that. And as, as the conversation kept going, I'm marking, they don't know, oh, they're self-regulating, oh, they're help-seeking, they're doing it by phone. Other times, they walk in because this is what students at my college who feel love do into our offices, <laughs> right? And Remember those magnets you had in your science closet? Can I borrow them? And so, so they did many things to seek help that we were watching, and they knew we were watching, but at times they forgot we were watching, but we were, and taking and documenting, okay, during the first phase, they were looking for help by phone, coming to the office, 10 minutes before the lesson, they did all that. In the second phase, they're doing their lesson. They cannot be interrupted. They're in front of 30 children in a public school in Brooklyn. So we're just sitting recording. What are we watching? Well, we're watching to see if that student looks up to the cooperating teacher for help. And many times we saw that where they would look to the cooperating teacher and give like a little eye, kind of, okay, am I going on the right track? All of those little nuances, we watched and we documented. So the research was tedious but it was um, reliable. So that was the second part. Then the third phase was after the lesson. And after the lesson, we call it debriefing. They will meet with us, and we will talk to them, and we will ask them how they think it went. There was one student in the book, if you read the book, you buy the book, you read the book. <laughs> there was one that the first time we observed her, she did not self-regulate, she did not help see, she was petrified, and she stood there to in a lesson, kind of like a robot. And we're like, what's going on? And after we spoke and said, you know, you could have done this, or we were watching for this, the second time we observed, it was amazing. It was like a transformation. It was perfect. And she grew professionally, because that's what we want. We have to produce a teacher at Lyons College, not a student a teacher, a professional teacher that will be certified by New York State that says you can now start working in any given school in this city and you're qualified. And to do that, like Dr. White said, when they come with some deficiencies, not because of them, but there are gaps because of their education in high school, and we do such a great job here at Lyon College with our developmental courses and guiding them, they also need this training. And so to get them to that point where that professional teacher who's excellent can now get a job, we needed to do these things. Now, I'm going to take a minute because I'm almost done. How many here are in my foundation class? Raise your hand real high. Okay, put your hands down. How many of you already did a practice state test? <laughs> okay, hands up. We start early. The semester, we're just in midterms. But I think by the third week, they were introduced to the state test. Why? I'm not trying to shock them. What we're trying to do, Dr. Wine and myself, and we're still collecting data, but we're not using it as kids. We just want to see what's working, what's not working. And from there, we go into workshops so that they will be prepared for this exam. Why we want you to succeed. That's the whole key of what we do. We do it because we want you to succeed. And so, findings. There's a link between social cognitive theory, which is self-regulation, and the success of these four teacher candidates. All of the four participants share how their self-efficacy beliefs acquired during the time of the program, 
transfer to their profession. And we followed them two years after, and all four went into graduate programs and were certified and are working as teachers. And well, there's one that not only did he finish a master's degree and completed a second certification, he's now on his third certification back here with me to do the bilingual extension. And so he'll have three different licenses. And all because he learned this. And so I introduced you, Jose. You guys are really lucky and blessed to have uh, Dr. White, oh, Professor Velez, as your professor. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the benefits of self-organization and health seeking in my personal life as a student and now as a professional. Uh, I first, when I came here, I graduated in uh, May of 2011, and then um, I was hired with the DOE right away. So one of the, uh, the key things that they do is that before you graduate, you graduate certified. So that once you graduate, you're marketable and you're able to get a job. Whereas some of my friends who went to NYU or Queens, because they don't have to uh, be certified when they graduate, you know, they're still looking for jobs or they still have to take the exams. So then um, when I got hired in, in uh, August, I worked as a second grade teacher for the first three years. And then uh, my third year, I was working on my master's for uh, teaching English to speakers of other languages which in, in the school system is like ESL. So I'm like the ESL teacher. And then um, I obtained the master's in teaching, um, TESOL, in the fall, and now I'm currently working as the English as a new language teacher and the coordinator. So uh, my position in the school has changed and evolved as I've uh, gone on with my education. So the first thing that I, I had to do was, and you have to be real with yourself, is you have to know yourself and know your style of, of learning and of just being who you are. And so when I first attended college, I had no idea as to what to expect. Um, no one in my family had finished high school, so I was the first one to attend. So I had no one to really go to and ask, hey, you know, what should I look forward to, you know? So I thought of myself as a very well-organized and motivated individual, and I enjoyed working by myself. Don't put me in food. I mean, just like, no, let me just let me just be myself. You know, let me just do me. And rarely did I seek help. But boy, oh boy, after my first semester, did I quickly realize that I needed help, and that I wasn't as independent, or I wasn't as motivated, or I wasn't as organized as I thought that I was. And so, and my priorities were all over the place. I mean. You know, I would come to class Monday through Thursday, and I didn't touch a book until Sunday night. Let's keep it real. All right? Um, and so I needed help. And so one of the things, um, my first semester, before I even entered the program, one of the first people that I met was Dr. White. And she was very quick. So she's very sharp, and she looked at me. And she just kept moving. So I'm just like, okay, that's nice. And then I met Professor Velez, who's a total opposite. Yes. And she was so loving and nurturing. <laughs> but when it came to the grading, you know, I find that Professor Velez was a lot more tougher, and Dr. White was a little more lenient. You know, um, so I needed help. And so one of the things that I needed to do was I, I realized the power of reaching out. And um, I didn't look at it as like, oh, like they're gonna look at me as like I'm dumb or like, you know, I don't know much. But but like it was more like a pot, like an, an empowerment tool for me. And uh, I was part of small groups. And there were times that Arlene, myself, and some of the other uh, alumni, we would stay in the lab. Mm -hmm. And we would just work on the papers <laughs> together. Or we would, back then texting wasn't as big as today. Uh, but we would like either email or we would just reach out to each other. And that was one of the things that I think brought me over the hump and I was able to progress and I was able to excel in my studies. And then I had to give up on my social life as well as some of my church life. Uh, I, I used to be in the, the praise and worship team and you know the children's ministry and uh, 
and I enjoyed hanging out and going out to eat, you know. And so I had to give that all up, you know. And I had to focus in on my studies, and I had to go to Dr. White and go to Professor Velez and, and, and ask them, like, where, you know, what am I doing, like, or how can I improve? And then I realized that as I, as I started to get a better, you know, closer relationship with both of them, and I saw that they genuinely cared about me, not only as a student, but as a person in, in my spiritual walk and in my academic walk, then it kind of motivated me to want to do better. Mm -hmm. You know, like, and I remember in high school, I had one English teacher who, from the very beginning, I thought she hated me. And she was just, we're saved, so we can't use her. <laughs> but I really felt that she had something against me. And then in June, um, she comes to me and she looks at me and she says, do you know why I was this way with you? And I said, no, Sharon. And then she says, because I saw something in you that you didn't see in yourself. And so sometimes people see the potential in us, but because we don't see it, we become lazy. We become, we lack the motivation. But once you get that spark or that person who's interested in you, then it kind of gives you that, that starter and you just, thank God. Thank you God. just uh, move on. Uh, but in the end, it all worked out. Uh, my grades improved, and I went on to be the first in my family to graduate, and with honors. Um, and although Naya could find job and prepare me for my career in teaching, I realized that I, I still needed to reach out for help when I, when I became a teacher, when I was appointed. Um, and so help seeking, uh, help seeking is still relevant and active in my life today, especially with the new position that I'm in, uh, because they just kind of throw you in the water, like, and you're either sinking or swimming. And so to swim, you gotta reach out to other teachers. You gotta reach out to the administrators, and even coming back and reaching out to some of the professors, you know. And uh, and now I teach my students to seek help and regulate their own learning, uh, even from kindergarten. Because uh, a lot of times, you know, I see those students that just want to go by themselves. So you have to you know encourage that that cooperative learning. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Being at NIAC, 
I, very similar to Jose, I gained a family. It was very supportive because I know that I had a desire and a passion to teach, but I wasn't equipped or I was not prepared for, for it. I wasn't prepared to become a professional. So in this program, I built trust and I built relationships that have been long lasting. I still come back, I still seek when I'm having breakdowns and my principal is not the one to go to and my colleagues are not like, what do I do? Um, it's crazy right now and I'm always, you know, redirected and given that support that I need. And if it wasn't for that, for that being part of my life in NIAC, then I think it would be really hard to get through teaching now. Um, I definitely learned that you can't do, do it alone, especially in the teaching world. And, with all these laws and regulations and then having boundaries between your faith and the DOE and all these laws, it's really important to have a support group and have somebody to come back to and get you back on track and remind you why you chose that profession. Um, I attained the skills to become a professional and an effective teacher at NIAC. And um, after NIAC, now I am teaching my own students how to become self-regulated and seek help and building meaningful relationships and equip, equipping them with the tools and the skills that they need. I'm a fair grade teacher and you would think, well, you know, how do they really seek help and self-regulate? It's so critical teaching them from young, such a young age because I saw when I was my first year in fourth grade, um, we had Common Core just became the trend, and we had, you know, lots of difficulty transitioning them into Common Core Alliance curriculum and getting the results that we wanted to see. And I remember these kids, they were just so stressed out. I'm like, how so bad when they're fourth graders? Why are they stressing their lives like that? But they were so stressed out, and we just created tools. We created tracking goals that they, they self-monitored, and at the end of the year, they did amazing. They all passed the state exam, mm -hmm. and they were a, they asked for tutoring, they asked for extra support, they asked for extra work, and I was really impressed to see my own students doing this, and I felt really good because I wish that I had that when I was younger, and to teach them that now at such a young age, it's, it's amazing because it's something that you're gonna need all your life. Um, so that has been my journey in IAC and how the afterlife. How that is. Okay, so um, my name is Andreas Collins Well, for those that came in a little bit uh, later. Uh, I'm the Director of Admissions here, and I have an incredible honor of uh, drawing this to a close a little bit and kind of putting things together from my perspective and from what you've heard today. Um, first of all, Dr. Velez and Dr. White, uh, incredible hearts, incredible uh, work that they've done here for years, and as, as evidenced by the students sitting next to them. And, uh, and, and if you want proof of what happens here, it's right there. And it's coming with those of you that are not just in the education department, but those of you that are in other majors here as well. Because what they've talked about to me is, is every any time I have a conversation with Dr. White or Dr. White, it's all about um, every time I hear them, it's, it's heart. It's the heart that matters, and and it's what gets poured into day in day out uh, at this place. And it, it's why I'm here. It's the reason why many of you probably were drawn here, those of you that are incoming freshmen, this is probably the reason why you were drawn here in the first place. And those of you that are here in your sophomore, junior, senior, or whatever year, it's why you stay here. And why someday when you will graduate, you will be as proud as Arlene and uh, Jose. Jose, thank you, Jose uh, are, of, of the time that they've had here and, and the respect and relationship they have. So, so to me, it's, a, it's an honor to stand here and just basically clap and say <laughs> incredible, incredible work. Uh, so yes, please join me. So, um, that's, that's really it. I mean, that, that's all I can share from, from my perspective. Uh, in, in admissions, we, we, we often talk with the admissions counselors who many of you have worked with, many different counselors over, over the time. 
And, and one of the things that we talk about there is um, what kind of students are you looking for? And, uh, and oftentimes, it, it's not always the students that have some of this, right? This, the self-seeking, the self-help, and I need help. I, I really want to pursue an education. Oftentimes, the students that come to us, yes, they have that, right? Like many of you do. But oftentimes, they're not. I don't know if any of you can relate to being at a college fair or being at a church. Somebody told me about this. NY, Yak thing, or something. Yeah. And they said it's a Christian college, and so why not, you know? And, and somehow we end up in, in that place where now we're engaging in college. So wh whatever the case may be, um, we find ourselves looking for students that are open. You guys are here. Uh, I, don't, I don't believe this is a requirement. I don't know, maybe it might be, but is this a requirement for some of you students to attend here today? It might be so. Uh, but regardless, you guys are here, and you're receiving gold by just being inspired, hopefully to continue. I know some of you are, are coming freshman year in the foundations class, or, or whether you're a little further ahead. Uh, regardless of where you're at, uh, it's beautiful to see. And I'm just in awe of what these ladies have done. And uh, Jose and our team, awesome work. You guys are a living example of why we are here and why um, we love what we do in the Lord's places. So congratulations to you guys. Uh, I'm going to open it up to any questions. Any questions or even comments? Questions, comments, thoughts from you guys to any of our folks here? Yes. Um, I have a comment. I'm, a, I'm an alumni, and I'm a product of Dr. White and Professor Velez. And um, just like Jose and Arlene, I've taken the gold from them, and I've been equipped with tools to be an effective teacher. Even when many times I've cried in their office that I could not teach, didn't want to do it, I've tried to go down a different path and then I get a call not to and to go on an interview and um, because of them and their work with me and their patience and love, I have a student who came to the school just to observe and now wants to come. And I don't think that's because of me, I think it's because of what they what that student saw here at NIAC and because of the love that they could tell from them. Because this is a different type of school. So press on whatever means you need. <laughs> awesome, thank you. So any questions, thoughts? For Arlene, for the now's your chance. You got these guys that have gone through it. This is a good time for you to ask questions about the program, the testing. Um, if I could just make a comment. When I said we were collecting data for 10 years, they were not at the very beginning, but they were close to like a seven year span of observing data is not boring, data is valuable. So when we took our first LA, back then it was the LAST, right? Mm -hmm. And what we do in the program is, use it, that are in it now, we do a pretest, and then we sit down and say, okay, this is your score, look at how many you got right, rather than how many you got wrong, and then work towards the next level score. So we talk about in our, in our department, we have proximal goals. The goal, yes, at the very end of the rainbow, I want to be a teacher, but what is your goal now? What is your goal for the semester? And that's why this book is embedded in goal orientation theory. It's also embedded in other learning theories, and I just want to make this clear. This was peer-reviewed by people from all over the country that are scholars. So what we connected to NIAC core values actually has been given recognition by other people in other colleges saying, this added dimension that we call Christianity, that we call from our love of Christ comes our work with you, that is real. That, that is what propels us when she's crying the night before. You didn't need much help as we moved on. But I did kind of grab you a few times. And <laughs> and you story. So she has, I just want to share that, that we, we did not look at our students as data. We just looked at the data as how to help our students. I didn't want you to think you're all now in the lab. Because <laughs> we're done writing books. Because data helps us see where are the weaknesses in our program. So, or even in our own class or the course. So that we can now guide you. So you can succeed in those exams. You can ask questions then. Any questions for anyone? Go ahead, Richard. Um, uh, it's for um, I mean, you guys can ask me. You guys, um, Always so comfortable um, speaking with of these people. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. I still am. 
Um, I'm super comfortable in front of my students and being observed and speaking to the crowd of people, not so much, but this process in itself, just speaking tonight, I'm like, send me another track. Is this one that is, yeah. am I on the right track? Like, so I think that that really helped me like calm my nerves for today because I just not generally a great speaker, eloquent speaker, but I need to gather my thoughts, write it down, see what I wrote. So as a way to help me cope with that, I'm like, Sending them PowerPoints, emails, does this work? Does this work? But that's her self regulation. Is that as she's processing and she has set the goal, she looks at that goal and she says, wait a minute, I set that goal too high. I gotta take a, you know, think about it, call Professor Velez or Jose, what can I do? You know, that's self regulation. She's a choice product of us. <laughs> <laughs> I saw more ants. Mm -hmm. um, you kind of explained it already, but I wanna know more about like the beginning part of how you, what was the process of you teaching when you first started, like, what were the first steps, like, oh, that, you, that you applied from what you learned here in school, like, what you learned in your classes, what were the first beginning steps, like, the process of it to teach, to actually teach in front of a whole classroom, mm -hmm. like, um, well, I, in the school that I started, I started as an educational associate, yeah. so that's like a teacher assistant in the mm -hmm. charter school. And I had um, many responsibilities like as a lead teacher. Um, I had learned all the tools that I needed to learn as far as how to take data, how to do lesson plans, all those things. But it's, it's really different when you're actually in the school. You know, you read so many things in the textbook, but when real life hits, it's like, and you have real scenarios, you gotta learn as you go and, and continue seeking help. So I was an educational associate. I know that there, I knew that there was room to grow in that school. And I started reaching out to my coworkers. We would get together, plan together. I would always double check everything that I did and not just, okay, this is what I'm doing. And just because I think it's right, I always had like a second opinion, third opinion. Would approach my principal, what do you think? You know, do you think this is gonna work? And the feedback that I would get helped me become a better teacher. And eventually they they saw that potential in me and saw the effort that I put in and the help that I always seek and I was promoted to a special educator and my first year of special education was last year and I was so lost. I learned so many things in the books, but like I said, in real life, it was completely like another story. And um, I had to really like learn the books all over again and trial and ever, working with people, working with the students, working with the parents. And this year, um, this is my second year as a special educator, and I've grown so much with what I've learned and the process of getting help and working with other people that it's become so much easier, especially with the kids that I have this year. It's, it's a big load. And I came to them when I got the, when I knew that I was getting that class, I came straight to Professor, to Dr. White, and I'm like, you would not imagine what kids I'm gonna have. I have a class of 30, we're 20 at, like 20 of them have issues, and it's like, I just wanted to meet their needs and help them and be a great teacher. And they were able to just like, take a step, let, you know, what are some things that you are you going to be dealing with? And they were able to help me, and still today, I'm always like, oh, hello. Yeah. Like, one of the things we did in the study is called teacher efficacy. So we kind of break them early on. Were you going to say that? No. Oh. <laughs> okay. um, on what do I have the skills to actually learn first? That's okay. where we start. That's self-efficacy. But then when I'm in the classroom, do I feel like I have the skills to tell? Or, or to teach so that the student will learn. Oh, okay. And Arlene went through the process of going from her self-efficacy to her teacher efficacy, and she's never stopped growing. And, mm -hmm. and that's the whole thing that we kind of preach here, if there's any other word, that you never stop growing, you never stop learning. And you cannot be afraid to reach out because there's a stigma attached to help seeking that is very much in the Western culture, mm -hmm. but not in other cultures. Mm -hmm. So when we step across that ledge, like I called it when I was in college, the help seeking ledge. We are then very surprised that there's someone there to catch us. Janice, I just had a, um, a comment, and when Marie, sorry, Dr. White just mentioned about 
You never stop your well, friends. And listening to this as a retired principal, assistant principal, I'm a lifetime learner. So I'm learning from this. And then as the director of admissions, I'm hearing and I'm seeing there's certain things. I know this school is a Christian school, and I will go on record to say it's a good school to also promote for students who right now may not be Christians in high school. Because when I hear of self-regulation and seeking help, oftentimes um, a teacher who would come to me to say, Ms. Reed, I need help. I don't know how to do this. Those are the teachers that I realize were motivated enough to want to do well. Mm -hmm. And the other part that Jose and Arlene are not telling you, because Arlene, I know of you because of the gathering that you'll find out later on in the other session, both of them have been very proactive in helping to support teachers in their schools, teachers that they come in contact with. And it's important, even in all your activities, to self-regulate. I self-regulate even now at this juncture, mm -hmm. over 60 years old, to say, okay, maybe I should say that to my son, maybe I shouldn't say that to my son. <laughs> I'm still going into schools to train, and oftentimes, you have to also get rid of your pride and ask for help. The computers always have a help button, so we have to also use that help button. And people will work with you when you say help. In light of what Dr. White said, I worked at a bilingual school real quick, and we had Chinese students. We found out that they were cheating. So one of the teachers said to them, how dare you cheat? How dare you cheat? They were not hurt because they considered that helping each other. So those are the kind of things that you have to see because you know we wanted. To, so that's that diversity that you have to see. They would say, "Miss Reed, he." Then I said, "He." They can't tell. Then I realized the proverb for he or she is tasha, the same thing. In Spanish, we have la muchacha, el muchacho. Also, with the diversity. If you have an aunt or uncle, you have to say whether that aunt or uncle was the brother or sister of an older person, the older one or the younger one. And that's how you see the importance of um, learning. So I want to get the book. I didn't get the book yet, mm -hmm. but I want to be able to use the idea of it in the, in the schools that I still travel in. One, one last question. Yes. Did you always have time um, whenever they used to ask for help? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, we don't. Always have time, you know, but we make the time as much as we can. So some students have even made the trek out to Pennsylvania to my house. One time we got a van and they all walked all over there. They come to the, Dr. White's house. They'll call us. They'll text us. Um, it sometimes is intrusive in my own personal life, but this is what God called us to do, and this is what we do, because we're in the process of preparing excellent, not just with your excellent teachers, for the word of God, there's a, a world out there of children that needs an army of Christian teachers to infiltrate the four of it and bring hope, and that's our next session if you want to hear about yeah. that. Yeah, <laughs> but I want to add this. The help seeking we talked about is called academic help seeking. So when they came prepared, then we, we helped them. So when a student comes not asking for an answer or, oh, I don't remember this, that's we sent you back to the source, which is the syllabus, the advance, whatever. Right. But if we, cut, if we have a step beyond that and we call it academic help seeking, that student is coming prepared knowing what they don't know and then they can ask the specific questions. There's a little bit of a difference in that. Because I know you think I'm never here. That's what you think. Like, <laughs> I know what I can see right now. She always finds me. <laughs> so thank you all for coming. Um, I'm gonna, if it's all right, but I, can I close the prayer? At least so, yes. Yes. for you guys and for everybody here. So Lord, I thank you so much for this time together. I pray specifically for Dr. Velez and Dr. White, that you may increase uh, the blessing that you have already bestowed upon them, that their hearts may be enlarged, and that, Lord, as students come to them from all walks of life, that you give them the grace, 
the wisdom, the patience that you so have bestowed on us and write through them to us. Lord, I pray for Arlene and Jose. They continue to bless the schools. Um, give them the love and the care and the heart they need to be able to care for those students, to uh, work with them, to challenge them, uh, and more than anything, to love them. And Lord, and for everybody here, Lord, may we be enriched by these words, by these lives, and may we walk out of here inspired and drawn closer to you. Amen. 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 Our title for this symposium is Educating in an Urban Setting, Working from the Heart. Now, we have two founders, one who is, I think she knows, going to show her picture. Um, so back in the day, when I started at NIAC, I would call Professor Velez on a Sunday afternoon, maybe like 15, 16 years ago, and I'd say, what are you doing? And she would say, oh, Rachel is here, we're working on lesson plans. And I'd what? What are you, you're working on lesson plans? Like, didn't Rachel graduate already? Like, why are you helping Rachel with her lesson plans? Well, justice. Like, do you have students that graduate over to your house? She's like, yeah, I'm helping her. I'm helping her. And I found that to be a little shocking for my lifestyle. But it wasn't such an unusual thing for Professor Velez to do. And her heart went out towards the students who, when they left us, would be struggling. Then we met Dr. Gott, Renard Gott, who is ACSI's head for uh, urban education. And when we were speaking to him, we learned about something that he had, God had laid on his heart, but he had done some scholarly activity and research on what he calls the cause, which you will hear more about later. So this comes out of two people that were in totally different parts of the country that were thinking, you know what, once you leave here, you're gonna need a support system, especially if you're teaching in the public schools. And what confirmed this for me was, I was in church one Sunday morning and I ran into a student, not literally, but I bumped into a student that was struggling with her job in a Brooklyn um, middle school. And that week, one of her students had been stabbed in the head um, and she was all shook up and she didn't know if she wanted to stay or whatever, it was a scissors, some other student. And I, would, I said, why didn't you call us? Why didn't you send us a message? And what I got from that was she shouldn't feel that alone, that she should have felt more connected to us. So there were the students that would actually come and visit with us and then there were the students that didn't know that they had us, access to us. So that's where this concept of working from your heart came from, Dr. Gant, um, made us even more aware of how important it is that we use more than our professional skills, but there's another motivation that comes from the heart. So the scientist that I am, I went looking online and I kept thinking, is there a connection between the heart and the brain? Obviously, yes. But where the Greeks were so into that everything was coming from the heart because they didn't realize what the brain could do cognitively, and so if you remove the heart, then the person would die. So they thought that's where learning was happening. And I was thinking, well, maybe all the scriptures referring to the heart really mean the brain. But then I found this. And it says, this is his statement. After 30 years of studying the heart, I am learning that exciting scientific findings are providing a dramatically different understanding of the heart and its relationship with the brain and the human body. The rich neurologic and endocrine structure of the heart make it possible to train the heart from acting in a frenzied and disordered manner during stress and anger to working in an optimal manner from lessons of peace, love, and harmony. Now he has a lot of research on this and I just found it overwhelming. And then he said, the implications for education and treatment of clinical disorders, optimizing work performance and offering students strategies to maximize their satisfaction and achievement are profound. So in tonight's symposium, you will hear from Jose Martinez, Sonia Fuentes, Jan Dolly, Andre Hayes, and Laura Rodriguez. And we begin with Jose. All right. So I work with the, uh, the English language learning population in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Uh, and I'm, a, I'm the teacher, the, uh, English as a new language teacher there. Um, I graduated from NIAC in May of 2011, and then I was hired with the Department of Education in August of that same year. 
So one of the benefits of coming here was that when you graduate, you graduate um, certified, so you, it's easier for you to get a job. Um, and then I worked as a second grade teacher from 2011 to 2014 in the same school, and then I obtained my master's in teaching English to speakers of other languages in the fall of 2013, and, uh, and now I'm currently working as the English as a new language coordinator and lead ESL teacher. So um, I work with all of the bilingual students and all of the English as a second language students in the school and their families, as well as the teachers. Thank you. Oh, click or move. No problem. <laughs> um, one of the things that I found when I first started was that um, in order to have an effective relationship with the families that I work with, I needed to build trust. And one of the first things that you do when you're working with people is you have to build bridges. And open avenues of, of communication. So uh, every morning I would just walk by and I would say good morning, or I would just smile or nod to them. And even with a little bit of Spanish that I knew, I would say hola, como estas? You know? <laughs> and uh, with my Arabic students, I would just greet them with a salam alaikum, malaikum salam. And you would see that as I was doing that, the families would look at me, they would laugh or smile, and that made the connection a lot more easier. And then I also had to empathize with the people that I serve. You know, like um, knowing the culture, understanding the culture, understanding where they're coming from. Those are all key things that makes you a better teacher. And then you have to pray for the families as a whole, because those students that are in your class are coming from situations that they have no control over. And um, you're only with them for six hours, or in my case, I'm only with them 45 minutes to 90 minutes a day. And so that that short time that you have with them, that you can invest so much in them that it can make a difference uh, throughout the family. So uh, the pastor that I, that the pastor of the church that I go to, he had the saying that says, the need is the call. And so a lot of times we, we know that there is a need and you know we want an audible voice from God. And it doesn't, no, the need is the call. So if you see a child in need, then that's your call. Like that's, the area where you should uh, want to help. So uh, I truly believe that the, pa the families that I work with, they put their trust in teachers who show compassion and concern for their students as a whole. And uh, in my case, that, that was able to, I was able to, to relate to a lot of families. And I didn't even know that, um, that they trusted me so much until I met this one family. And we're going to call this, this child Jennifer. Jennifer, uh, she was a new student in our school, and she was new to the ENL program. So right there, she's in two different environments that she was not in the year before. So everything in her little world is new. She's in second grade. She's a bright student, um, but she's very shy. And then her parents are illegal. Both parents are illiterate in both Spanish and English. The mother has other children living in Mexico who are much older than Jennifer. And the father's an abusive man and an alcoholic. And the child begins to fall behind in her schoolwork. She's not doing homework, she's not studying, not reading. Now, I'm not her classroom teacher. I only service her for 45 minutes, 90 minutes a day, for four times a week. But for some reason, this mom wanted to share all these things with me in one meeting, on one Tuesday afternoon, we sat and we talked. So she scheduled me with me, and during this, this parent engagement session, she starts sharing all these things, and I'm just like, oh my goodness. Mm. Like, I could have easily, it was 3.15, I could have easily said, look, I have to go. Like, it's time for me to go. But I just sat there and I listened to her. And as she was talking with a little bit of Spanish that I know, I was able to talk back with her and reach out to her, and then, she just started to share. It almost turned into a prayer meeting. <laughs> like I had instrumental music in the background. Like it really did almost turn into a prayer meeting. And so after that, I, I talked with the mom, and you know, I, I said, I'm going to, um, I'm going to really, really check in on Jennifer every day. Go to her classroom teacher, speak to the classroom teacher, see what it is that she's struggling in, and when I pull her out for my services, see what areas that I can help her in. And so as I was doing that, uh, mind you, this is a second grade student. She's seven years old, and she even hits the mom. Now the mom's afraid to discipline the child because she's illegal, so 
So all of these factors play a huge role in this child's education, but not only in the classroom, but outside of the classroom. And so, you know, after we talked and we went uh, to the school social worker and the counselor, and we started reaching out to the family. Uh, I even offered my time for the mom to come in so that I can help her with her English. She didn't take advantage of it, but the offer was there. So as the year progressed, um, Jennifer excelled. She passed uh, the nicest lab, which is the New York State Achievement, uh, the English Achievement Test. So she passed, she tested out of the program that I was serving her. So I no longer see the child, but I make it uh, um, one of my priorities to visit her classroom teacher just to check in periodically, just to see how she's doing. Uh, she's currently in the third grade. And now the mom, although we have nothing to talk about, you know, besides Jennifer, she comes and visits me uh, during my parent teacher conferences. She just shows up just to say hi, just give me a hug or a kiss on the cheek. You know, and it's all because of the relationships that we built. The trust factor is there. And so in that sense, we had, it was a very professional relationship, but there was a, another connection and it was the heart. And when you do that, and when you uh, genuinely care about the students that you service, the parents will see it. And they will go to you and ask you for help. I have no kids. I'm younger than, you know. I'm, she's twice my age. And so she's coming to me for help and guidance and support. And it's because of the connection, the relationship that we make. And it all comes from the trust and the which it happens. So. Mm -hmm. Is it like we're, we didn't try it yet? Should be on. classroom that I would be in. And I remember administration and teachers telling me the frustration that they faced with a specific child. And um, even to a point where they thought that he was mute because he did not speak. There was barely any language there. Uh, so they told me I would have a difficult child who has a defiant attitude, who lacks engagement, who is often isolated from the class. And um, the first time I met him, I saw a lot of what they were talking about. So I walked in into a music room. And you would think in a classroom with music, the teacher's engaging them, the, there's different activities going on, that the child would be engaged. But meanwhile, I found him on the side and he was just lying down and I introduced myself to him. And in that, I already knew the challenges that were to come. But I learned throughout the year working with him that he needed one-on-one -on -one attention. He needed that small group in instruction and he needed consistent support in different areas. So I also noticed that not everyone involved um, had the capacity to be patient with him. A lot of the times they would see him as a child who was misbehaving. So they would not understand that that behavior came out of the, you know, the autism spectrum disorder that he had came out of his condition. And so they were challenged and they didn't know how to handle it. And I remember walking in the hallways and then just people telling me, you know, I don't know how you do it, Ms. Fuentes. You have a lot of patience. But then constantly reminding myself that those 10 minutes that I spent out there in the hallway with him 
just for him to finish his outburst, that that is a reminder of what God has put me there to do. Uh, so the misunderstanding often became a tug of war between a frustration between teacher and student. And the transformation I put up Romans 12 2 says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And it resonates a lot with me because every day that I walk into the school, I always uh, remind myself of what God is doing through me and what he's doing specifically with me and special needs children. Because not a lot of people would think of working with special needs children because of the challenges that they have with them. And so in working with him, I've had a lot of growth within myself as an aspiring teacher. And in the growth that I've seen him motivates me every day to continue to do what I'm doing there. So um, as an educator with the Heart for Christ, I did a lot of things that went out of my job description. And the Christ-centered service came from doing things like making a chart. So I kind of brought an example here for you guys. And I just, I had a schedule for him because I noticed that, you know, children that are diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder need a routine. They need to know what's coming next. So I created a schedule for him. It was a routine chart. And it was very simple. It had his name at the top of it. And it had three rows. The first row explained uh, the times. The second row explained what was coming up. So if we had technology or library or the morning routine, he would know at what time that was coming up. And then if he met his goal, which was on the third row, he would either get a star for that so that he knows, OK, I'm aware. I met my goal. I did what I had to do. And then, you know, if he still had some incomplete work or some improvement to do, I didn't want to do a sad face just because I didn't want to uh, relate it to uh, something negative. So I did kind of a neutral face so mm -hmm. he knows that, OK, I need mm -hmm. to improve. And um, with that connected, I kind of created a prize board. And the prize board, this was from like last year, so it's a little beat up, but it's um, the prize board and he has to choose what he's working for. So he's constantly aware of the fact that he needs to improve, he needs to um, meet his goals. And I always make sure to make his goals reachable. You know, even if it was just like the kids had to do five sentences, he, if he did three, that was a goal within his health mm -hmm. that he accomplished. So the prize board included things like this, having a snack, he loves the iPad and technology, um, and even lunch with me or, or taking a walk. You know, simple things like that that he worked towards, and it motivated him to do better each time. <coughs> so that was the routine chart. And then along the way, I created alternatives for him. So I did things like um, work on him with his writing, because he gets occupational therapy. His penmanship is very weak. So I did things every morning. Um, I put my name here. But you know, where he could just trace his name. And I did mine too with him, so that he sees, you know, I'm engaged with you. I'm here for you. I'm trying to help you. Mm -hmm. And um, it helped. And his writing has improved a lot. Uh, the results. Then he had minimum language, as I said. And now he he's always known now. Now he every everybody knows him. Administration even sees how he has grown and, and how his language has developed. And um, in the beginning, he used to use small phrases. He would point to things. He didn't really know how to communicate. And I would constantly correct him uh, to form complete sentences. And uh, then he was reading at a level A. Now he's reading level I, which we're in second grade. Uh, but reading level I for him is a lot of progress. And um, he did not enjoy reading at all in the beginning. And now, because a lot of the times he'll do reading on the computer or um, on the iPad that sometimes the school provides, he's engaged. And that's the type of alternative that you have to find for uh, special needs children, things, or children in general, you know, things that are going to have them engaged in the classroom, the support that they need to be able to, to accomplish any of their goals. Uh, and he used to be very dependent. And one of the things that I'm so proud of him today is that he takes it upon himself to participate. Before, I remember seeing him and knowing him as someone who was always, always isolated. And he didn't have a lot of friends. And now he's constantly 
involved and he's asking me, oh, Ms. Fungus, can I, can I say this answer? Can I do this? You know, and he's taking it voluntarily upon himself to engage with other students. And he has friends and he's playing. So he's socially involved. Um, and yeah, there's many differences. So working from the heart, I learned <coughs> just working with him that Christ stops and takes you to a lot of places that you never thought you would go to. And he challenges you. But in that challenge, he meets you wherever you are. And so he equips you with the armor of his of his kingdom for you to do what you have to do with these children and serve him through that. And so that's what I've I've come to know that not only do I, I want to teach, but I know that I have to teach because it's something that I'm called to do specifically for special needs children who are a lot of the times the last of the bunch. Center, right? This is a suspension site. So students get suspended, they get sent to me. It's a short-term suspension site, so I don't get to learn who the students are as much as my colleagues would. Right? So sometimes they're suspended for maybe 10 days, uh, 30 days, 60 days, 90 day periods. Anything beyond that, they'll go to a year-long site. But you have to have a spirit of discernment to just know who they are and when they're walking in, by the way they walk, by the way they talk, by the way they look. All right? I believe the best way to do it it's about teaching, approaching, conversing, walking in, doing everything, standing on love. So teaching from the heart. Love, now I, I came up with an acronym. So the L stands for light. All of these definitions come from dictionary.com. <laughs> so L, light. This is what you're providing them with when you're providing them with love. Light, an illuminating agent. That's who you are. Opportunity, a good position, chance, or prospect as for advancement or success. Validation, to give legal force to, legalize. I'll explain it a little bit. Encouragement, to inspire with courage, spirit, or confidence. These kids need this. Why? Because they walk into the building believing that they're criminals. They feel like they're going to jail. Right? And when they first approach us, it's like, I gotta prove myself. I've just been sentenced to a big, I'm gonna show everybody they can't mess with me, right? So, there's the source. Which I know I'm not still anything at all. Why do I teach? Here's my mission, to educate students using love as a foundation for every lesson. My vision is to see students reproducing the love they learn from me. The reasons change with the times, but there are many reasons. I find that a current purpose of mine is to encourage my students to live up to higher standards than those they hold to now. Mm -hmm. Let's get into the name, Greg. Teacher from the heart. Yeah. <laughs> I told you this part already. That's my site, John J. Alternate Learning Center. I'm an English teacher. I also teach music, life skills, gym. I almost came in my gym clothing. <laughs> then I decided to go home since I had the time to uh, change to <laughs> Right? But what is professional? <laughs> if I'm a gym teacher, then that's professional, right? Um, at this site, we get a few new students every day. Right? So suspensions last from 10 to 90 days, as I said. A majority of them come in with that thought of proving themselves, just to reiterate. And um, that's not who we are. I'm determined to show them that we are a place of second chances. Mm -hmm. They come, they learn to be better, and they go back to their homeschool and prove to them that they can. Monday's story. You know what? Let me click ahead. I didn't see how much time I had. You have six minutes and 40 seconds. I want to I wanna put this up there. Right? So, interceding before conflict grows, right? And I can tell you beforehand, before I go into the story, that 
My coworkers come to get me now from out of my classroom to go and intercede now, to go and prevent something from happening because of what they see. And they're going to see it now when I tell you the story. So one new student wrongfully approaches another new student, right? It's bad English and I'm an English teacher. But <laughs> I jump in before a fight can be brought about and disable the possibility for tension, anger, and a physical fight. What did I do? Here's, in, here's what the story is in detail. I walk into my classroom. I only have two students at this time. They walk into the classroom before me. Others are late. Others are slowly trickling in, right? One of those students are new. I know he's used to blood because of the way he's wearing his clothes. So he's part of a gang. He sits down, and I see the other student who's been there for maybe two weeks, right? He sitting in my chair. Let's say, please, let me get my chair. Not because I have to sit there, but I don't want anybody fighting him over that nice chair. Right? All the chairs in my classroom were nice, by the way. <laughs> he should have sat in the right chair. But I said, please give me my chair. He didn't listen at first. I said, please give me my chair. Said, oh, huh? So I noticed he was showing off for the new kid. He wanted to let the new kid know with that. Don't mess with me. I said, come on. Don't do that. If a new kid comes and you have to disrespect me, then you don't love me. Mm. He said, nah, nah. You know, I was just kidding and everything. I took my chair. Right? The next kid comes in. He's new. And the blood says, yo, what you jacking? That means what gang are you representing? Mm -hmm. Right? That's his first few words to this new kid. Right? It upset me. Sometimes I let these things slide to see if they can work it out on their own. Right? But the kid said, what do you mean? What am I jacking? He said, you from 900 block, right? Mm -hmm. He said, nah, I'm not from 900 block. He said, you look like this boy I know from 900 block. So I see it getting rowdy. So I say, <laughs> so I say, Wow, are you from 900 block? You don't even know what that is. I said, this is exactly how I respond to them. What do you mean I don't know what that is? What are you talking about? Just because I'm a teacher, I don't know it? Do you even know me? Aren't you new today? I don't even know your name. Did you ask me my name? You never got to know me. But you're telling me who I am? I get it. You have a spirit of discernment, but you're wrong. So I say, listen. Anytime you bring anything into my classroom, it involves me. If you're standing out in the hallway talking, I can't involve myself. But once you come into this space right here, it's all me. I get the chance to ask you a question. I said, let me tell you something. I respect every last one of y'all, and it's love from jump. It's love from jump. Why? Not because you earned it, but because you're a human being, and that's who I am. I'm here. I'm here. I said, I'm here to help y'all. I said, what's unbelievable is that you're so into these games that you're asking people when you first meet them if they're in the game. I said, so you respect that, huh? He's like, nah, you know how it is. I said, you respect that after I went in debt to stand here in front of you? I paid to get here. I understand that I invested in your life before you even showed up, and that's how you're going to treat me? You respect those drug dealers more than me? Those gang members more than me? And I'm the one showing you love? I'm the one building you up? How are you going to do that? He's like, nah, sir, it's not like that, it's not like that. I said, yo, it's love from jump. A new kid comes in, right? He's like two days in, right? Um, he started last week. He says, he said, nah, nah, that's real. He comes over and gives me a handshake. Nah, nah, that's real. He said, he's, he keeps it 100 all the time. He keeps it 100 all the time. He says, that's, and I have the students backing me up. And I'm noticing, I'm like, yeah, yeah, you got it, you got it, you got it, you got it. You felt the love. And the reason I could approach them like that with so much energy and enthusiasm is because... I love them within it. So it's never a yelling where I'm yelling at them and then I eventually get the security guards to come and get them. Right? It's me putting them down to bring them up. So putting whatever spirit that they come with, I put that down and I bury them up on love. And I show them, and here's the results, right? I don't even think I need this anymore, but here's the result. Here's the result. This kid went from you don't know nothing to go in the gym with me and skipping basketball, which he wanted to play, to now working out and lifting weights with me. Wow. Don't you think I could do more? Yeah, the way you're throwing that up, you should be at like 100 or something right now. Let's try it. Out nine. I got you. I'm going to spot you right now. Hey, yo, man, this is so. We're having a good time. I'm sorry. Said, We're having a good time and everything. It's good, right? Today, the same guy, you know, it takes time. My pastor always says, change is a process, not an event. Right? 
takes time. So now he doesn't do that in my class, right? It is new, but he, he respected me today. He did. He overworked today. He overworked. He did more than what I asked him for today. He goes to the next class, and he asked the new kid today the same exact thing that worked. So they come in, they get me. They say, hey, could you want me to get him out of the classroom? I'm like, all right, just give me a minute. He's like, no, no, we need you to come down. So I said, oh, it's about to be. I walk in, immediately, stop. Yo, Mr. Hayes, to me, instead of talking to this kid down, so Mr. Hayes, why this kid wild here? He's walking out with me. I just said, oh, yeah, explain to me everything. And that's the respect that I can get mm -hmm. because they know that I love them. Mm -hmm. And that's everything to me. Mm -hmm. That is everything to me. That is what makes everything so beautiful. And, um, I think that's my time. Thank you. <laughs>
colors his wife's hair, and um, he goes to the U.S. Tennis Open and does, you know, Serena and all those, their, their hair. And he's not intimidated by anybody because he's highly educated. And the only diploma this young man has is from the Jandali School. That's what we call it. <laughs> and um, I became a teacher because he made me feel so good about being a teacher. And when I was 50, I applied to the New York Teaching Fellows, and I was the oldest one in my class. But I went into public school, and unlike you, I thought I had the right motive, but the kids just like got on my nerves because they <laughs> trashed my lessons. They didn't appreciate what I knew, and I um, just felt really frustrated. And I kept, you know, trying to plow ahead with my lessons without trying to get to know them. And I thought my first two years were a waste. This is a girl named Malika. I took them on a field trip just to go ride on the Staten Island Ferry because we didn't have any money. And um, she, she was a really mean, obnoxious kid. But I ran into her last summer in Ikea. She called me down and she said she almost dropped out of high school, wound up in a transfer school with some of the other kids from my eighth grade class. And they said, in that transfer school, when they were learning living environment, they kept referring to me as all of the things that they had learned from me. Now I have to go real fast. This kid at the transfer school had been there already a year before I got there. And his hair was over his face. He'd been there a year. He hadn't talked to anybody. He hadn't done a single assignment. And when I showed up, he was in my, my worst, my lousy class where everybody was disrespectful and stuff. But for some reason, he started doing his home, his work. Mm -hmm. And when I would sit down next to him, he had a lot to say. And I let him hang out in my room and he did some special science projects. He's majoring in chemistry. He's going to graduate in June. Our school didn't have a chemistry teacher, so I gave up my prep period the next year. He was my chemistry class of one, and he did fabulously well on the Regents exam. I still know him today. I've known him about six years. When he graduates in June, he's going to need my help finding a job, and I, I'll, I'm going to be there for him. These three boys, he uh -huh. is an undocumented um, immigrant from El Salvador. He uh, spent 70 days walking in the desert with very little food or water, crossed three rivers, and almost got deported when he got here. But when he made it to Brooklyn, he is like, he was, he's graduated now, like the best student in our class. All the teachers would say, he's homework, he's prepared. And one day he came to me, he was like getting sick and he was exhausted because he was working a job that exploited him. Five o'clock every night, six days a week, until one o'clock in the morning, and they paid him $3 an hour. And $9 he had to spend getting a bus home, I mean getting a cab home because of the buses, right? So he walks home, or, or gets home, and, and it's undermining everything that he's doing. So I helped him find employment, and he is at my house every week. He's in college now. My daughter helped him to write his story for the random uh, a scholarship which he won, a really nice scholarship out of 330 something students. And um, having written his memoir helped him to get a full scholarship to Monroe College where he's going to become a chef. Um, this little boy is an immigrant from Haiti. His mother died two summers ago and he was shipped up to Brooklyn to a father that he didn't know, to a culture that he didn't know. And he was very vulgar. I think it's probably the only English words that he knew, but he was just very, um, everybody avoided him. He just, he could ruin every class by the words that he was spewing out of his mouth and touching other kids and acting very inappropriate. So I had a little class of him and nine other boys, and we learned about the human body. We dissected a lot of pig and cow mm -hmm. organs and stuff, and he, He's really calmed down, and I am teaching him to read. He doesn't know how to read the exact same person that I taught Rudy to read. And I'm, I'm glad that I have that. Um, a little girl from Brooklyn Tabernacle that I found, that I tutored her th through her math regions. And this little girl, 
graduated. Uh, she had struggled all through high school. She has learning disabilities. And last January, I tutored her, I prayed with her, and she passed three regions last January. But now she's in college and can't place her, pass her placement tests, so she's not allowed to go to classes. Mm -hmm. And she's no longer my student, but I'm in the arena with her to help her solve her problems. Mm -hmm. And Paul Schwartz, an affiliate here at Nyack College, he's a counselor at her college, and he was Sergio's um, advocate there. So, um, her name is Shanti. And um, I know that I'm going to know all of these students, you know, well into their adult life. Um, this is a song I sing in the car. It's a Brooklyn Tabernacle song. Um, I'm not going to sing now. I don't <laughs> sing then. But it is um, about God's kingdom coming into my classroom and about changing this generation. So, my, my children. I know you're a mathematician because you timed it perfectly. <laughs> Absolutely perfect. So I knew I was going to be a teacher by the time I was five years old. And 55 years later, today, I've been struck by this scripture. We are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. God dwells in me. I didn't always know that. But somehow, God was always there. And now, 55 years later, after I made the decision to be a teacher and be in education, I've come full circle trying to understand with others that I work with what that means that God lives in us. Because our conversations are a lot about, well, what if the child does not attend a Christian school? Right, with protocols of prayer and protocols of discussing godly things and the curriculum is a given. But what if they attend public schools? Like I attended all my life and I worked all my life in public schools. What about educators who are Christian and work in public schools? If God really does live in us, well then when we show up, God is showing up, and that is powerful. Mm -hmm. That is revolutionary, and we spend a lot of time now, and in the work I'll discuss, just looking at that and trying to understand the depth of that, of the implications mm -hmm. of that, just that scripture. I actually wrote some notes, so I'm gonna sit down in a minute, and I wanted to share my thoughts with you, so I'm gonna read it, and I think I'll do it in 10 minutes. Well, that's why we have time. But, I also just want to review the, the PowerPoint that you have or, or that is up here. So the first part of my talk is about what has motivated me all these years to remain in education and work with challenging and struggling students and families from disenfranchised communities. What is it that has motivated me? I also want to talk a little bit about a God-empowered model, which we have been discussing in a group, a national group, that identifies three components, two of which we know, heads and hands, right? To become a teacher, we go get our credentials, we spend a lot of time in professional development, and we perfect our craft and our, and our strategies, but what about the heart? I think my colleagues here have very well connected the heart to heads and hands and how they're intertwined. I'll talk a little bit more about that. And so if we know that God dwells in us, and many of us have worked in public schools, are working in public schools right now, then what are we doing about it? How are we supporting teachers who are Christian and work in public schools and beyond? 
and I will speak to that issue and what our group, which we call ourselves the cause, God's cause, what we are doing and some of the steps we are taking. So I am just now going to go back to the first part and read in the next nine minutes my thoughts from my notes. Working from the heart requires that hearts, hands, and minds be closely intertwined. Every day, I find that the Spirit of God reminds me and reinforces in me that He dwells in me. While I do find that very comforting, I also feel that God has put a great responsibility upon me as God's standards are very high. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. I am his people, and he is my God. So every day, I know I have to do my best to illustrate in actions, words, and thoughts who it is that lives in me. The comforting part, however, especially during my 34 years of service in the New York City Department of Education, and now as a volunteer, volunteering my time as an educational advocate for struggling families and communities, I know that when I go somewhere, God too shows up, or he lives in me. But the question is always the same. How do I, as a follower of Christ, work with the Holy Spirit every day and allow him to be front and center so that his power is unleashed as I do my work? During my teaching years in the South Bronx, I used to wonder how my high school students, who had just arrived for the first time to an English language school system, as high school students, would become proficient enough in English to successfully graduate from high school and go on to college. They had to work hard, and I had to work even harder as a teacher. I had to step up and raise the bar for myself for, as I read recently in a great devotional, 180 Devotions for Teachers by Drake, she says, Jesus never lowers the standards to accommodate our weaknesses. Very heavy. And that gives us a lot to think about. God will help us develop into godly people and godly teachers and it will require that we continuously grow in him and seek him. I find this exceedingly motivating. God himself, who lives in me, provides motivation for me to keep working for his cause. I was blessed to be given amazing leadership opportunities to work in disenfranchised communities throughout the city of New York. With those blessings came an immense sense of responsibility. I encountered many challenges and fought hard not to be intimidated by the naysayers, there's lots of them, or by the sheer immensity of the work and challenges. For example, I worked with many groups and school teams to create new schools so that parents would have more quality options in diverse communities. Often this meant transitioning or closing existing schools. You've heard about that. And that's very hard work, where many students were not growing and graduating from school. But at the same time, I also fought very hard to keep existing schools open, where, where there was enough going on and enough substance and leadership and, and the teachers rallying around the students. I fought hard, too to help those schools redevelop from within and to do better by the students and meet their needs. Whatever the challenge or opportunity, I'd rather see it as being afforded to me, I would be motivated by God's word, for God did not give us a spirit of, of fear, but one of power and of love and of a sound mind. When God places you somewhere, you will very often be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I think I spent most of my days being very uncomfortable. 
but I learned to remain teachable. A trans another word for humble. Mm -hmm. I remain teachable, and I also try not to stay in a panic zone. I find that many educators work in a panic zone continuously. It is not healthy, and it does not allow us to do the work we need to do. Rather, we should stay in a learning, growing zone. And sometimes there will be panic. But we need, we need the Spirit of God within us to give us balance and to bring us back to a learning zone. So the word of God itself, the word of God itself has motivated me all these years to keep advocating for and supporting struggling families. In 1 Corinthians 13, the word of God says that love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures every circumstance. And so that's my response to what has motivated me to remain in education and specifically working with challenging uh, situations and students who are academically disenfranchised and economically disadvantaged. A model that we've been looking at as a group, we call it a, a God-empowered three-dimensional model that involves the um, hands, heart, and the heart being the key, the heads, hands, and heart, with the heart being a very key component. In education, we spend all those hours acquiring our credentials, the heads component. And we invest many hours perfecting our strategies and ongoing professional development opportunities. This is very important to our profession and vital to our success as, as educators. In the amazing opportunity I have gotten to work with a national group of educators in the last three years as I have retired from the New York City Department of Education, with educators on this panel and in the audience, I've gotten a, a very um, close-up look at what heads, hands, and heart could mean in education. That in fact, we can unleash power within us that flows from the love of the heart of Christ within us. We call this group The Cause and its leader, Dr. Bernard Gant, who is the director of, the schools, of school, Urban School Services for the Association of Christian Schools International has a vision for this God-empowered three-dimensional model. I'm reading from one of his articles. The third dimension, the heart dimension, cannot be achieved through higher education credentials or professional development practices. Educationally disenfranchised and economically disadvantaged children require connection. Connection with an educator provides inspiration. How do educators provide this connection? Love. I think Andre and my colleagues here spoke very clearly to that. God's love has been poured out upon the heart of the educator through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us from Romans 5.5. 5. Connection, inspiration, and learning are also all intertwined. Our daily prayer then has to be to allow the Holy Spirit through our instructional planning, yes, when we're home planning, and teaching, so that learning connections are made by students in ways that help them grow academically, socially, and spiritually. The love that flows from the hearts and which permeates our teaching can be powerful and is transformative, just as Jesus transforms our lives when we accept him as Lord and Savior of our lives. 1 Corinthians establishes a blueprint for us as educators. Imagine a teacher patient with her students, kind towards the parents, not arrogant, not dishonoring her colleagues, not in it for self just to draw a paycheck, not easily angered by the administration, not holding grudges, committed to the truth, always protecting her class, always trusting the Lord, never giving up on the students, but always hoping the best for them. 
God's standards are very, very high. And that blueprint is in 1 Corinthians 13. I don't have my glasses on. Huh? We're almost done. Okay. Finally, as I mentioned before, one of the responses by this group, compelled by the love of Christ called the cause, some of its members are here in this room today, one of the responses is to begin was to begin an outreach effort, a local grassroots effort to teachers, especially those in public schools, teachers who were Christian, to come together and together to consider the components of a God-empowered, Christ-honoring education, heads, hands, and heart working together with especially that connection of the heart. And we have started a group in Brooklyn, in Jan's home, she is our host on Sundays, and we've just initiated a group in Queens, Arlene, where is Arlene, has helped us to begin that group in Queens, and I have heard that there is a, a request to consider a group in the Bronx. Finally, I'll end with a quote from the book, 180 Devotions. Teaching is one of the most important career paths imaginable in our society, and yet it is perhaps one of the most discouraging due to hassles and lack of recognition. Ladies and gentlemen, if teachers become discouraged, then teachers will be affected. How do we support teachers? How do we support one another to continue working from the heart to make that significant difference? After all, we know that the word of God says that when two or more are gathered in his name, he will be there and he lives within us. We have um, a sheet that explains the course that I'm going to ask Jose to pass out. And if you are a teacher and you're interested in the course, or if you know of a teacher in your church that's teaching in public schools, or private school and is interested in attending one of the groups in Queens, or the one in Brooklyn, or the one that we're uh, attempting to start in the Bronx, you can give them the card, they can fill it out and send it back to us and bring it back to us and we'll put it over to them pass that out. Uh, if you're interested in a group in Manhattan, go ahead and write it on the card. Uh, you've heard educators uh, teaching from the heart, and we hope that um, Laura is the um, chair of the membership committee for the course, and Dr. White and myself, we're very involved in this. We hope one day to see in our nation a whole group of Christian teachers standing together, holding each other up so we can help each other. That's our dream, but it's not a dream without a goal. We're working towards it. A dream that doesn't have a goal, it's just a fantasy. We have a dream and we have a goal, and we're going to achieve it thank you thank you thank you for laura thank you for Andre. thank you for jan thank you for jose thank you for Aline. thank you lord for what they do every day quietly and nobody sees these heroes that are unsung that are going into the classroom to bring your heart and your hope and your love to the children in our city bless the children in our city bless our school system and bless our teachers in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.